Good morning, everyone. You made it to the 11 o'clock. We've already had a 9 o'clock, which was awesome. But you're here now for round two. And um, I'm excited to start a new series today. It's going to be really good. Uh, I'm Ron. This is my beautiful wife, Erin. She's here with me uh, today in the second service. And uh, we want to welcome you guys. We're so privileged to be the pastors at Coastal. If you're new, if it's your first time or you're still feeling new, in front of you is a connection card can fill that out. Right here in these doors, there's a Next Steps booth. Hand it to the guy there. It should be Brandon or someone. They'd love to give you a gift and love to just connect with you. Uh, no pressure, but just want to say you're welcome here. Uh, ushers, you guys come down. I want to receive our giving today, and I, I want to share a scripture with you. Um, I did this in the first service, kind of off the cuff, but I, I thought it was so good to just read this. Um, this is a scripture out of 1 Chronicles 29. It's a story of how David was receiving an offering to rebuild the temple. And this is what he says. This is verse 14. He says, But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? So David was just, he was flabbergasted at the generosity of the people. And uh, he, he was just saying, man, who, he was really humbled by it. This is so good. He says, everything comes from you, and we have given only what is from your hand. Isn't that so good? I love that when we talk about giving, when we talk about tithing or, or investing in God's kingdom, it really is all his in the beginning. I know it's got your, your name on the bank account, you know, at Chase, right? And I know you worked hard for it, and I know you had opportunity, and you took advantage of the opportunity, but, but it's all his. And, says, and David says, everything that we have, you know, he, he didn't boast in what was given, but he really boasted in it that it was God's anyway. He says, we're aliens and strangers in your sight, as were all our forefathers. Our days on the earth are like a shadow without hope. Oh, Lord God, as for all this abundance that we have provided for the building of a temple for your holy name. It comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. That's so good, right? I don't care how much money you have today. You may have a million dollars in your bank account. You may have a $5 million real estate portfolio. You got commercial property. No matter how much you have, it's all his, and it all came from his hand. That'll keep you humble, won't it? I know my God that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. Man, that's so good, right? I know, God, that you test the heart and you're pleased with integrity. All these things have I given willingly and with honest intent. The integrity of our heart as we give is so, so powerful. And now I've seen with joy how willingly your people have given to you. Oh, Lord, our hearts are loyal to you. Keep our hearts loyal to you. You know, I want to just honor you, Coastal, because so many of you guys give so generously, and you give with integrity in your heart before God. You give with integrity before God. You don't give to show off. You don't give to make a big deal of it. You give because you know in your heart of hearts that everything comes from God's hand. You give joyfully and generously because you believe in him and nothing else. And God is honored in that. And I want to honor you today and thank you for that. So as you give today, you give joyfully because it's with integrity in your heart. You know it all comes from his hand. It's his anyway. Amen. So Lord, today I just thank you for these people. And just as David rejoiced, I just rejoice that, that there's an abundance. And there's more than enough in every home of every giver here at Coastal because they give with integrity in their heart. The intent of their heart is to honor you. And this is a holy moment. They get to do that with the sweat of their brow and the increase of their life. So bless that in Christ's name. Come on, Coastal, can you say a good amen? Amen. Go ahead, guys. Amen. Thanks, Nate. Um, well, today we're starting a brand new series called I'd Be Happy If, and it's going to be good. Uh, we're going to take four weeks to really talk about 
uh, you know, this idea of, of discontent and dissatisfaction and some areas that the enemy tries to come in. I've got the awesome assignment today to talk about I'd be happy if I was beautiful. Now, for me, that's a tough subject, right? I know it should probably be some woman up here talking about this, right? But now I got to sign this topic. We had an awesome women's conference over the weekend. Ladies, were y'all there? It was good, right? And I heard so many great things from Aaron and Tia and Maggie and all the ladies that were a part of that. And uh, so I got the fourth session of the weekend. This is, I'm actually the, the wrapping up the women's conference today, I guess, uh, talking about being beautiful. And um, so, yeah, we'll see what happens here, right? Uh, this is definitely a challenging subject for me. But the core of this series is just the idea of what makes us happy. What makes you happy? Now, for me, there's three things that really make me happy. The first one is I love a big steak. Come on, somebody. Amen. This right here is what you call a tomahawk steak. A couple years ago on New Year's Eve, me and Ben and Mauricio and a few of these guys, we went out and spent an ungodly amount of money and got these 36-ounce monster tomahawks. We got them cut down here from Jim Torchio's Finer Meats. You guys ever been there? That brother hooked us up, and we cooked these things. I got pictures. I wish I could find them. It looked like a club, like I was a caveman, these big old monster tomahawks. But I love a good steak. And then the second thing that makes me happy, come on, is a little barbecue. Anybody like some barbecue? Come on now. And then, of course, I'm a southern boy, so the third thing that makes me happy is some collard greens. Anybody like greens? Amen. My Georgia folks right there. Some good old greens, some barbecues and steak and greens. No, I'm just kidding today. You know, you know obviously, it does make me happy, a big steak and some barbecue, but, but really the joys of my life are obviously coastal and my family, my children, my wife. You know, those are the things that really bring us happiness, right? But food can be one of those things. In fact, for many years of my life, I, fi I tried to fill a place of dissatisfaction with food. Any of you guys ever heard of comfort food? Come on, somebody. See, it can be one of those things, but I'm just being facetious and joking around. But every person in the world is looking for happiness. They're looking for what will make them happy. And we're always desperately seeking a person, an experience, a possession, something that's going to bring us satisfaction. But the truth of it is, is that our hearts, unsurrendered to God, are a black hole of discontentment. You can fill it up with all that you want, all the experiences, all the money, all the stuff, all the people, all the sex, whatever that would be, you can put in that place and your heart will still scream, I want more. Nothing could ever make you happy outside of Christ. See, it's a human condition that all of our hearts are prone to dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. This is a big deal. Dissatisfaction is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Dissatisfaction is the reason wives cheat on their husband. It's the reason why men cut backroom deals and do illegal things. It's the reason why we overconsume social media and binge uh, Netflix. Dissatisfaction is the reason why we get addicted to drugs and alcohol and, and go crazy with all these False love affections because we're dissatisfied. We're discontent. We're dissatisfied. And dissatisfaction in your heart unchecked will lead you down a path of destruction. And for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about some common areas of dissatisfaction. And again, today I've got the privilege to talk about body image or being beautiful. Okay? So hang on tight. <laughs> it's going to be good. <laughs> Scripture says in Psalm 139, verse 13, it says this. For you, O God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. That's so good, right? You created my inmost being. You knit me together. You fearfully and wonderfully made me. I know that you're wonderful. Your works are wonderful. I know it full well. Let's pray and then we'll go. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for imparting some life into us, bringing some healing and strength. 
Lord, anoint me to share good news to Coastal. Anoint their ears to hear truth. Spirit speaking to their heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, here's the thing. Is that comparison starts at an early age. And it tortures us our whole life. Comparison starts at an early age and tortures our whole life. From the moment, I, I mean, I don't have a very vivid memory of my childhood, but I can remember feelings as an 8, 9, 10, 11 year old, feelings of inferiority, feelings of like, you know, you automatically, you know, even in school, you just start identifying these are the cool kids. These are the popular kids. These are the good-looking people. These are the pretty girls. These are the jocks. These are the, you know, you start identifying. You start measuring yourself up. You automatically, no one has to teach you how to compare. You start, and if you're not careful, it'll torture your whole life. I heard this guy say one time, he said, if you compare and compete, you'll always live in defeat. Isn't that good? Comparison. And oftentimes, we compare ourselves not just against our peers, but we also compare ourselves against the culture. Did you know the average person sees 4,000 to 10,000 marketing images a day? Every day we get to see these beautiful people, right, put up there, these images of people, these images of perfection, and we compare ourselves to them. We, we stand side by side and we say, that's good and we're bad. We see our imperfections and theirs. They're perfections. Now, for me, growing up as a big kid, come on, somebody. I remember one of the things I thought about in this message was as a young man, when we would go swimming, I was always insecure to take my shirt off. And I would literally swim in my shirt. Now, I told everybody it was because I was Pentecostal. I'm Pentecostal kid. We don't take our shirts off when we swim. I'm, we're, you know, but really it's because I was insecure about my body. I didn't want people to see me with my shirt off. It was a major insecurity, and it caused me to think of myself differently than everyone else. Y'all can feel me on that, right? Another thing I was thinking about, again, I've got the privilege to talk about body image today, but I was thinking about for, for so many years of my life that I had an issue with my feet. It's kind of funny, right? I mean, literally for, you know, 10 years, my fantasy football name was Gata Toes. G-A-T-A-T-O-E-Z. Gata Toes. Now, I told this in the first service, and we actually had some Gata Toes here. This is John Whitman. <laughs> John Whitman is a mechanic, guys. This is like a manly man. He sat on the front row and he whipped these off. And he says, Ron, I really got gated toes. Get it the blue and the orange. I said, John, you, you let your daughter do that? He says, no, I went to the nail salon. <laughs> so we actually really had gated toes. But, but I had this, you know, I had this insecurity about my feet. Now, nobody look. You, know, you always say that and people are like, you know, what, what's going on? No, my, my, my feet aren't that weird, okay? And they're not that bad. But I'm just telling you what happens when you have a body image issue. You know, it messes with your mind. You know, it messes with your perception of who you are. And um, that comparison can torture you. Um, Aaron talked about at the conference, who can define beauty? Are we letting those marketers, are we letting those GQ magazines or those Vogue magazines or those, those, those car commercials or those, you know, are we letting all those things define beauty for us? Are we allowing those things to tell us what beautiful is? Or are we allowing God to, to create his image, his ideals inside of our heart? God created beauty. This is so good. Aaron said this, and only he can define it. Only God can define what's beautiful. He sets the standard for beauty. Who is setting your standard? Now, I know I'm being funny about this, but this isn't just a woman thing. This is a man thing as well. And I know we don't want to admit that, but we do measure ourselves by our appearance. And that's unbiblical. Can I get a good amen? It's unbiblical. God sets that standard of beauty. Genesis 1, 27 says this. 
it says that God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then verse 31, God saw what he had made, and it was good. I want to tell you, Coastal, that that word, ladies, when God looked at you and said, it is good, that is greater than any compliment or affirmation your husband could give you, a boyfriend could give you, a, a sister could give you, that word over your life that it is good speaks loudly into our hearts to tell us and affirm us of who we are. It is good. And I don't know who came along and told you that it wasn't good and who tried to convince you that you weren't good enough. But the Lord says, it's good. That is good. Amen. He defines beauty for us. Why don't you look at the person beside of you? Come on, look at him real quick. Just survey him a little bit and say, ooh, this is good. <laughs> This is good. Keep your hands to yourself, all right? <laughs> Keep your hands to yourself. Get a room if you need it, but not here at the church, all right? <clears throat> not here at the church. Here's the thing, is that God created us. You see, you were carried by your mom. You were carried by your mama, but God created you. Isn't that good? You were carried by your mama, but God created you. Psalm 139 says that he created our inmost being. He knit or stitched us together, right? And I had this, when I was meditating on this scripture, I thought about this. Now, this is a, this is a, a teddy bear from a different era. I don't know when this thing came through. This is like a 70s or 80s. Brandon said, your mom gave this to us. I just found this at the house. This was yours as a child, really. How old is this, Aaron? Did you play with this thing? Because it's scary. <laughs> no, I actually think this is a pretty cool teddy bear. It is kind of, it's kind of interesting when you think about, you know, this is how teddy bears have changed over time. See, even the, the, uh, the thought of beauty for teddy bears has changed over time, you know? Right? Now, now they have a lot of fur and they're more plush. This is tight and... So it changes. It's a moving target. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Beauty is a moving target culturally. Anyway, I'm just talking about, my, I'm talking about my teddy bear, okay? But the Bible says that he created our inmost being. One of the things I thought about is that, that I wanted to communicate to you is that teddy bear here has been stuffed on the inside. There is things inside of this teddy bear, right? And, and you, as God's daughter or God's son, God has placed things in you. He created the essence of who you are, the innermost parts of who you are. And that is what is important to him. He created your inmost being. He put destiny and purpose and gifts and talents and a personality and compassion and love. He put the inside of you with such intentionality that loyalty and faithfulness and strength, who you are is beautiful because God created that. We're so worried about the appearance of who we are, but God says it's the inmost things that I care about. When they talked about Saul in 1 Samuel 16, God said to the prophet, he said, don't look at his appearance. He might be taller than the rest of them, but I've rejected him. God doesn't look what man does. God looks at the heart. God is looking at the inside of who you are. He has put things in you, and how are you stewarding those things and what makes you beautiful? I can't get no help over here. How about over here? Thank you so much. God, your inmost being, who you are, we put so much emphasis on this outside appearance, but God created something so beautiful on the inside of you. I want to say to you, Coastal, I have such a passion for the body of Christ. I love 
people because when I see people, I see God's church. And when I see God's church, I see something beautiful. And every one of you are uniquely created just as you were for God's plan and purpose. You're different and unique and and set apart and you are totally unlike everyone else, but that's the beauty of his house. You know what? Some of you are constructive and coordinated and you got your closet all organized, red shirts, blue shirts, black shirts. Some of you got a closet like mine. It looks like a bomb went off in there. You know, you're just scrounging through things. That's okay. That's who you are and it's beautiful. Some of you are on time. Some of you are on your own time, right? You know, it's like... When I get there, it should start. Okay, I get it, right? We're just different in every way. On the inside, God created us beautifully, but that's the beauty of the kaleidoscope, which is the church. Don't compare yourself to everyone else because of an appearance. Don't do it. God created the innermost part of you, and that is, is where the beauty originates. He goes on to say that 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 beauty, he stitched you together in your mother's womb. Now, when I thought about that, I think about this bear, you know, that God did create our appearance. I mean, we are who we are uniquely. I've got red hair, you know, I'm in the best shape of my life, round, right? Um, you know, I've got hazel eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm, God, he did stitch me together. He made me as I am, you know? And that's okay. He made me beautiful to him, right? You know, <clears throat> we're his sons and daughters. I think about, when you think about, when I think about my kids, okay, and I'm an expert because I have four. But as a father, and you parents get this, when your child is born, you just automatically operate from a disposition that this is the most beautiful baby in the world. I mean, just automatically. You know? It doesn't matter how that baby looks. You automatically believe it. And we know there's ugly babies. <laughs> amen? Shame on you for saying amen. Amen. Shame on you. That was testing you right there. But we automatically just believe, and I know this, you know, I know this from my children, like little Amelia, you know, I hold her, and there's just times where I just look at her. I mean, I just, I just look at her, and I'm just looking for evidence to con- believe, to, to back up my belief that she's the most beautiful baby in the world. Everything about her is beautiful to me. Okay? This is how the Father sees us. This is how the Father sees us. Our Father looks at us and he sees beauty. This is how we need to project the Father's heart and love in our marriages. We're not trying to fix each other. We're trying to create a sense of safety and beauty. Don't look at the appearance. Fat, skinny, tall, short, Gator arms, stubby legs, right? Come on, that's right, gator toes, bald, head full of hair. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Appearance doesn't matter. God created us beautiful in every way. He sets that standard. Anyone ever told you that you look just like your daddy or you act like your daddy? Well, I want to tell you something. You do. You look. You act. You are your daddy. And I'm not talking about your earthly father. I'm talking about your heavenly father. You are. I see your daddy when I look at you. I see his fingerprints on your life. Who you are is beautiful. What we do so many times is we focus on the imperfections, and it creates misconceptions. Or misperceptions. I'm the worst, and I know you are too, about just finding everything that's wrong about me. You know? Every little detail of what's wrong, I can find it and magnify it. You know, I can just 
magnify that thing, and it just creates a pattern of insecurity in me, a misperception of who I'm called to be. I love what Erin said at the conference. She said, our worth isn't based on our appearance. It's based on the fact that we've been made by God himself to be like him. Our worth is not based on our appearance, but on the fact that God created us. Don't consider your appearance when you are judging your value. We don't need to criticize what God has made, but rejoice in his creation, knowing that he makes no mistake. Well, I could get a good amen right there. Don't criticize what God made. Rejoice that he doesn't make any mistakes. He created you on the inside. He formed you on the outside. You're just as he would have you, and you're beautiful. Mm. Psalm 139.14 says this. It goes on to say, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. I praise you because I'm fearfully made. Now, when is the last time that you stood in front of the mirror with your big old beer belly, and you said, man, that looks good right there. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Have you ever done that before? Well, you're missing the point of this scripture. <laughs> you need to praise God because he fears wonderfully made you. You need to accept who you are, how you, you accept your appearance and praise God that he fearfully and wonderfully made you. You know, that word fearfully, it's, it really means to inspire awe, to strike awe. You know, you're awesome in every way. To strike awe. Uh, I was telling the first service, uh, in my college age years, we had a friend. Uh, his name was Casey, but we called him QM. And I won't tell you what QM stands for, but it was a nickname. And, uh, and he, he, was a, he was a good-looking guy. He's a basketball player. But he would go to the mall. And, uh, and, and this is, you know, this is in the 90s, you know what I'm saying? And he would, this is what he would do. He would see a, a, a beautiful girl. And he, he would do just this. He, he would go like this. He would go. He, he would drop it, you know. And this guy picked up a lot of chicks. I don't know how he did it, right? But he was, he was communicating to her that he was in awe of her, right? He was like, right? God looks at you in awe. He, he, he looks at you with such a love and in awe. He's inspired by, you know, it goes on to say he's wonderfully made. And that, that means to inspire delight and admiration, you know, when you, when you look at yourself, and, and again, I know today we're talking about something specific when we talk about body image. But do you look at yourself and do you hate what you see? Are you so dissatisfied like we talked about that it's created a, a discontentment in you that just has driven you? What, what do you, how do you, or do you say, man, I'm in awe of what you've made, Lord. I accept what you've made, God. I accept what you've made. And what you say, I say, I am beautiful. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that good? You know, that comparison is so deadly. That dissatisfaction is so deadly. It goes on to say, I know that full well. You know, I've been talking about this for the last few weeks because I feel like it's been such a revelation in my heart. The scripture of 1 Corinthians 10, 45, where it talks about how we don't wage warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. They exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. Strongholds will stop you from experiencing God. And I always give the example of how we can know that God loves us, but if there's a stronghold there, we don't experience that love. We don't believe it. Y'all follow with me? A stronghold is a negative pattern of thinking. They find a place in our heart through wounds of the soul. And again, lies that the enemy tells us, deception, and they become vows and judgments in our heart. You know, we, and we hold on to these things, and they really guide our beliefs. And I was telling the first service, you know, one of the 
powerful things about this idea of beautiful is that there's so many people, and maybe you're here, and you could say, well, I know that, you know, God made me, and I know that I'm beautiful, but you're not really experiencing that. You're not really experiencing that subtleness, that peace, that true, like, you know, acceptance of who you are. And I would dare say it's probably a stronghold. It's, it's, here's the thing. Let me teach you something. You know, we talk about mind, body, soul, and spirit, right? And we talk about how the soul is, is the mind, will, and the emotions, and how the heart, follow with me. If you've been here, you can connect to this. If not, just follow with me. How the heart is the connecting point between the spirit and the soul, right? That's the heart of a man. Well, the connecting point between the body and the soul is the brain, okay? Your brain is a physical part of your body. It's not your mind. Your mind is the place where information and emotion connect. Listen to me. It's the place where information and emotion connect, and information becomes a conviction. It becomes a belief. You see, that's why so many people in the body of Christ are not experiencing the full life that God wants them to have is because they know it in their brain, but it hasn't connected to their heart. That's why there's so many people that know that Jesus is Lord, but they haven't believed in their heart. Because we know that belief will dictate behavior. If you believe something, it'll change the way you live. If you know something... Y'all following with me? I'm going to tell you right now, I could do a seminar up here on nutrition and diets. But have I believed it yet? Come on, being open. Think about it. I could do a whole seminar on nutrition and diets. What to eat, what not to eat, when to eat, how many meals a day. I could do all that. I got all the information. But has it become a belief in my heart? Has it connected emotionally with me yet? I don't think so. Because there'd probably be some fruit, right? Because beliefs change behavior. See, you can know that God calls you beautiful, but not experience the peace and the love and the joy that comes from believing that you're beautiful. <laughs> And see, many of us, we create these negative patterns of thinking from an early age. Someone says something to us, they point something out about us, and it, it wounds our heart. We get a wound of the soul, and then we begin to get to think a negative way. We get a negative pattern of thinking. See, it hurt us, so we feel sad, and the enemy takes that emotion, and he pairs a lie with it. Oh, they called you fat, so you must not be good enough. You'll never belong. You're not beautiful. No one will ever love you. It's a lie attached to an emotion. Come on, somebody, I'm teaching today. It's a lie attached to an emotion, and it becomes a negative pattern of thinking, and then you make a vow or a judgment, and you say to yourself, I'll never be good enough, or I'm not worthy, or they're better than me because their face is more symmetrical and their body is a little more trimmed, and they've been to the gym two more years than I have. Come on, we're getting real today, right? Right? A wound, a negative pattern of thinking that became a stronghold that became a vow and a judgment you said in your heart and it affects everything you do. I'll give you an example. Let's say there's someone, a young man who grows up vertically challenged. Okay? And at some point in his life, that vertical challenge becomes obvious. Right? And these eighth graders who are just malicious, right, they start saying things about how vertically challenged this person is. Oh, you're a wee little man. Are you a midget? You know, and they start saying things. And that young man begins to think, right, I'm less of a man or I'm not as strong or, right? And it becomes anger in him. And then he makes a vow. No one is ever going to get the best of me. 
No one is ever going to treat me like that. And then what happens? You get short man syndrome. Right? And every time someone touches that bitter root, every, someone, every time someone touches that place where they felt rejected, where they felt less than, they explode. And the anger pours out. Y'all following with me? Who cares if you're five foot one? Who cares? Who cares? I mean, think about that. Who cares? Who cares if you're 500 pounds? Who cares if you're seven foot three and a girl? Who cares? <laughs> who cares? Really, who cares, right? But we create these things, these bitter roots in our heart. You guys follow me, right? <laughs> yes, God. But God wants to heal those places in us. And he wants to speak his truth. You see, here's the thing. You know how you displace an orphan heart? You don't cast it out like a demon. <laughs> you don't, you know, you don't try harder and do better, right? You don't try to convince yourself. What you do is you take truth and you displace it. Truth and displace it. See, you're here today, and like me, maybe you have wrestled with body image. Maybe you have wrestled with your beauty and who you are. And there's an insecurity in you like there has been in me. I'm being honest. What we have to do is we have to recognize those lies, those negative patterns of thinking, because that's what happened. We got wounded. Someone said something, we felt something, it hurt, absolutely. But then we started believing what the enemy said, those lies. So we identify those lies, and we say, no, there's a truth here. I'm loved by a father. He says, I'm beautiful. I'm created in his image. I don't look at an appearance. It's who I am that's important. It's who I am that is my beauty. You know what? God has a place for me. You know what? God has someone who will love me for who I am. I don't have to look like somebody else to be loved. God is the one who brings that person into my life. I'm not judged by my appearance. I'm judged by my character. I'm judged by the fruit of my life and who I am. So I don't have to live under the curse of these lies. Amen. Amen. You are beautiful. And I want to tell you, you know, going back to that story, I know it's funny. And there's other stories I could tell you. I feel like personal things where I really have felt the pain of this. And I've seen, I've had to allow God to minister to me and, and through Aaron and our journey, how God has really healed my heart. But this is a funny one and, and kind of a, you know, one that I could tell, but about the toes, right? I'll never forget, and she can, she can attest to this. I'll never forget the day, because I had told her about this, that I wore flip-flops in front of Aaron. Now, again, before this, I would always wear closed toe shoes. You know, everybody be wearing flip-flops, and I'd be wearing them them ugly Crocs. You know what I'm saying? You know, it was, it was comfort over fashion, right? And, um, you know, socks. But I remember the day that I wore, we were at the hill of, over at Trinity, and I remember the day that I came out, and, and she said to me, she looks at my feet, and she goes, Ron, it's not that bad. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your feet. There's nothing wrong with the. What do you mean? You won't wear. Ron, they're just feet. They're not that bad. And guys, I want to tell you something. Shit, honey, am I telling the truth? Something has shifted in me. I went and bought a pair of rainbow flip flops, y'all. <laughs> something shifted in me. It was like, okay. Yeah. Right? It's not that bad. And I want to say to you guys today, just prophetically, it's not that bad. 
Whatever's been torturing you, it's not that bad. It's not. It's not that bad. You don't have to live under that pressure. It's not that bad. It's okay. <laughs> it's not that bad. You're actually really beautiful. Really. It's not that bad. You're beautiful. Don't that feel good? Can you feel the love of the Father? It's not that bad. You know, maybe, you know, I'm a big believer in the body of Christ. I'm a big believer in James where it says we confess our sins to one another so we can be healed. I'm such a big believer in being open and transparent and being vulnerable and allowing God to bring healing through his body. You know, you might need to respond to this word today and you might need to find a sister or brother you trust and you might need to say, you know what, I've been struggling with this. I've been lied to and tortured in my mind about this and I just got to tell somebody. And you know probably what they're going to say? It's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's okay. And let the Lord heal that place. Amen? You know, I'd be happy if I was beautiful is the biggest lie in the world. You'd be happy if you were satisfied in Jesus. <laughs> if you were satisfied with who he created you to be, how he created you. Just go look in the mirror. Man, I like this. You know, this is good, <laughs> right? Because I want to tell you, and we know, now listen, we know health is important, the way you eat, your diet, your exercise. But you know what i found my whole life? Change really comes out of life not condemnation you know what I'm saying no one ever really changed because you know oh yeah no, no. people change out of life you know so I'm not making light of that today if you're on a health journey or but it's not that bad it's not this appearance don't look at the appearance the Lord looks at the heart and the heart is that place of belief and you know what the Lord would call you Listen to me, guys. If the Lord would call you on the carpet today for any conviction of your, of your spirit and soul is that you haven't believed him in your heart. You haven't believed him in your heart. You've known it in your mind, but you haven't believed him in your heart. 1 John 5 says this, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith our belief. Amen. I want to pray for you today.